Yeah, man. Yeah, all right, no problem. Yeah, listen, I'm just finishing up some eggnog. I, I gotta record this thing for, uh, for KringleCon. Yeah, no problem. She loves fruitcake. Sure, just get her fruitcake again. It'll be fine. All right, dude. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming to KringleCon, Two Turtle Doves, and uh, thanks for attending my talk. My name is James Brodsky. I work for Splunk, and I'm based just outside of Boulder, Colorado. This is my first time speaking at KringleCon, and I couldn't be more excited. I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. I lead a small global team of Splunk's most senior field security resources. Now, I've been at Splunk a long time, about six and a half years. One of the things I do every year at Splunk is to speak at our user conference on the collection and analysis of granular endpoint data. I'm also an occasional scenario creator, a constant author, and co-owner of our Boss of the Sock Blue Team CTF experience. When we created Boss of the Sock, or BOTS, four years ago, we were heavily influenced by what Sans and CounterHack have done with the Holiday Hack Challenge. So it's really great to be able to contribute back to it. Now, most of what you're going to see in the Splunk portion of Holiday Hack Challenge this year was created by my teammate and friend, Dave Harold. Huge shout out to him for what he has done there. Now, the point of this session is to teach you the basics of searching through log data in Splunk Enterprise. We, of course, use Splunk at Splunk to search log data because we work for Splunk. But in general, you don't have to use Splunk, and these techniques can be generically applied no matter how you are searching this data. However, you will need to use Splunk to solve a grand challenge and holiday hack challenge, so you have come to the right place for some pointers on how to do that. Our agenda today looks like this. First, I'm going to tell you what Splunk is. <clears throat> that might get a little salesy, but bear with me. Then we'll show you what data we put in Splunk for you. We'll tell you the basics on how to search it using fields extracted automatically from it. Then we'll touch on pivoting through the data based on timestamps. And finally, we'll show you how we're automatically processing email going to and from Elf University and how you can search through that metadata in Splunk as well. But first, what is Splunk? It really is like a giant frying pan where you put all your chestnuts of data, you roast them up over an open fire until they're extremely delicious, you crack them open, and then you use them to investigate security incidents. No, really, it is very much just like that. Any data with a timestamp, regardless of source or schema or format, is fair game for Splunk Enterprise. And it's why Splunk has become a de facto standard for searching timestamp machine data. We're particularly popular within security organizations across the world, large and small. We provide the ability to consume all of your security-related data in one scalable place, provisioned either on-prem or in the cloud or both, and then we allow you to search it quickly, manipulate it to your heart's content, gain significant insights from it. Uh, we are insanely great at security incident investigation and incident response, which is what we'll ask you to do in this challenge, but we're also useful across many other security use cases as well. And of course, any other data-driven use case you might have outside security. Okay, that's the end of the salesy stuff. Let's get down to some details. When you first log into the Splunk instance we've provided, it will look like this. Dave has customized it extensively for you to interact with several of the ELFU SOC personnel using a Slack-like interface. And you really should do so in order to start getting some hints and some guidance about how to solve the seven training questions and the capstone challenge question. Now, mind you, if you are a Splunk Ninja, you might just go right to that challenge question and answer it, be our guest. But for the rest of you, to get to the Splunk search interface, click the search option in the menu bar. Now, the first thing you may want to know about any Splunk instance is what data is in it. Two ways to figure that out are listed on this slide. When you have a leading pipe before a search command, it means you're not searching the raw data stored on disk, you're specifying what we call a generating command. When you run that first metadata one, it will look just like this. Here you would take that command, type it in just like it appeared in the previous slide, and hit enter. And you'll immediately see a list of all the source types of data stored in your Splunk instance. Now, source type, in general, maps to a particular variety and source of machine data. We'll cover these four in some detail during this talk, 
We really do have just a little data in this Splunk instance to make it very approachable and easy to learn from. There are only 17 types of data. One of the most popular types of data that Splunk security customers collect are Windows event logs. And the most popular way they do it is through something called our Splunk Universal Forwarder, which runs on just about any version of Windows, or Mac, or Linux, or some other operating systems as well. Now, in this case, we put a Universal Forwarder on a particular Windows 10 desktop at ELFU. We used some common best practices to set up Windows event log audit policies, as you can see on the slide. One of the most important things we're collecting from this machine are the 4688 events, which are process start events. And we also configured full command line argument logging. One thing about these events, the process IDs are reported by Windows in a hexadecimal format. Here's a basic Splunk search to show you all the 4688 Windows events in the system. You could pause the video if you'd like and try it for yourself if you want. Note up in the upper right that we are searching all time. Splunk collects all data and accurately timestamps each event as it comes in and is written to disk. In a normal Splunk instance, you always specify a time range to improve the performance of your search. Now in this case, there's very little data in the Splunk system, so feel free to leave this time picker at all time. Now Splunk reads the raw collected events off disk and it extracts all of the interesting fields from the data automatically at search time. It's a late binding schema, but it allows you to quickly see what's important in the data and explore it via mouse click. Now, because of the way we've configured these systems for the challenge, your fields on the left may not look exactly the same as this screenshot. You may have them categorized differently in terms of selected versus interesting. Here are some interesting bits of data in a 4688 event, it's highlighted at the bottom, the process ID in hex, and the parent or creator process ID, and then the full process command line of the process that executed on the Windows system at this particular timestamp. Now, what can we do about those hex values to make them regular integers to correlate them with other data sources? Well, it's the holidays, so let's get fancy. You can use uh, an eval statement, like the one above on the slide, um, to add a new field in your results. And what that new field is going to do is it's going to contain the integer value corresponding to the hex field. The eval command takes whatever is in the new process ID field, and then what it does is it runs the two number function against it with an argument of 16, because we are telling the function to convert to base 16, which is also the same as hexadecimal. Then we take that result and we make a new field in the data called hex underscore convert underscore PID with that value. If you try it, the result will look like this. We also have another extremely popular endpoint data source in our Splunk instance, Sysmon, written by Mark Grusinovich at Microsoft. This is a fantastic free add-on for Windows that provides very granular forensic data about many activities on a Windows endpoint, including, as you can see on the screen, file creations, DNS lookups, network information tied to process, process creations, registry changes, image loads, and so on. It's extremely configurable, but don't start from scratch with your Sysmon configs. We certainly didn't. Uh, our friend Olaf Hartong has provided an excellent modular Sysmon config that we recommend and that we used uh, this year in the Holiday Hack Challenge. It was forked originally from Swift on Security's work. Just Google Olaf Sysmon and you'll find his GitHub repo. By the way, I'll show you how we get this pretty output in a few slides. Anyway, let's talk a little bit more about searching. Type this into your Splunk search bar next. We're saying, search the source type called win event log for the free text string C bonus, which is a username we might be interested in. Splunk responds with the interesting fields on the left and then shows the raw event and highlights the free text in that event that we searched for. Okay, let's pivot out. Remove the source type portion of the search and see what other source types that the string C bonus shows up in. Now we are just searching for the text C bonus and we can see it shows up in a total of three source types and there's 1,421 events that contain that string. Here's another useful thing to do, summarizing our data by the fields we extract from it. I told you I'd show you how we get table output. Well, here's a search. I'll talk through it on the next slide. 
Here's the output. We're saying, take the sysmon data, count it up by each unique combination of event code and event description, then sort the output descending by the resulting count. So that's three search commands strung together with pipes. The first one returns the data, the second counts it up, and the third one sorts it. Now we have a very strong relationship with time at Splunk. In fact, we have many patents surrounding our use of timestamps in the product. One very popular technique for analysts to use during investigations is to find events that are time adjacent to other interesting events. Let's see how to do that in Splunk. Here, I have landed on a search that returns a single Sysmon event that's interesting to me. It's Outlook opening up a Word document. Maybe I want to know what happened on this system, or on any system, in the five seconds before and after this one event. How do I get Splunk to do that? Assuming you've landed on an event of interest, you just click the timestamp, and you'll see a pop-up that looks like this. You can enter a time range. In this case, I've chosen five seconds before and after this event. Then click Apply. And notice here that my search time range automatically changed to five seconds before and five seconds after my initial event. Now we pivot and we make our search term broader. In this case, I'll just put in a wildcard asterisk and hit enter. You'll probably be more specific in a real Splunk production instance, like specifying a host or an index. But to keep this simple, we'll use a star. Hit enter and you'll see all events anchored to your original time, but that happened in the five seconds before and after it. Very useful to see a sequence of events or, or to correlate activity that happened around the same time. Okay, finally, we'll talk about how ELFU processes all incoming and outgoing email. We installed an open source automation framework called Stoke that's now used by some of the largest companies in the world to provide automatic processing of interesting payloads. Think files, items stripped from network traffic, attachments, and other metadata from emails. In ELF use case, it gets a copy of each email, processes all SMTP headers and body and so forth, strips off the attachment, and performs a full analysis against the payload, which in most cases is attachments. Uh, Stoke is very flexible and configurable and has a whole library of these plugins. One thing it's doing for us at ELFU is to open up zip files, even password protected ones, by trying various common passwords against them. Then it expands and analyzes everything it finds, normalizes the output, and sends all of that data to Splunk in nested JSON format. It can also send to other destinations, of course, and it stores a copy of everything it processes in a file system. Those are called artifacts. Once Stokes' data gets over to Splunk, it looks like this. Splunk, in general, automatically parses JSON data and pretty prints it in the search interface. Splunk automatically navigates all the nested JSON and pulls out interesting fields, again on the left, but you can also click the chevron, as indicated here, and scroll down to see the contents of the fields, too. They look like this. Okay, one last thing and then we'll finish. I just told you that Stoke doesn't send the actual artifact it extracts from the payload to Splunk. It just sends the JSONified results. But there's pointers in that JSON to get back to the archived data stores. But how can we navigate the output that Stoke sends us and understand where to look in the archive? A search like the above will help us. And if you want to understand better what it does, you can DM me on Twitter or email us. I'll provide you with contact info in just a bit. The output for a single Stoke event might look like this. All artifacts extracted by Stoke from a single email are listed on the left, and the full path to where they live in the archive is on the right. Okay, well, I'm just about out of time, so not only should I wrap this up, I have gifts sitting in the corner that I should be wrapping up as well. If you have any questions about the content in this presentation, feel free to DM me at the Twitter handle listed. You can also DM the main elf wrangler, Dave Harold. Another way to get a hold of us at Splunk is to send email to the bots alias that we all monitor. It is bots at splunk.com. And with that, enjoy the rest of your time at KringleCon 2 Turtle Doves. Pick up your complimentary turtle dove at the kiosk outside. Happy holidays and happy splunking.